Good morning, Peace family, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Don Gallagher. I'm pleased to serve as the liturgist for this Sunday service. Let's worship God who loves us all, whether we're old or young, educated or uneducated, handicapped or agile, dark-skinned or light-skinned, rich or poor, liberal or conservative. Let's worship God who wants us to love our neighbor, the one who's weak, the one who's strong, the one we understand and the one we don't, and the one who's like us and the one who's different. So, let's begin by calling ourselves in God's presence and through a morning call of worship. From the water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. From ancestors of nations to the sun lifted up, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path. For where he is, we would be also. Let's worship God. Trusting in God's promises of salvation, let's confess our sins and let's repent. Together we pray. God of Abraham and Sarah, we know how weak our discipleship is. We can spend hours at the computer but only give you fleeting moments of our time. We can talk endlessly on our cell phones but fall silent when it comes to sharing our fears, our worries, and our hopes with you. We seek quick fixes to our problems rather than seeking your vision and future for our lives. Forgive us so that we might lay aside all that would keep us from you and take up the life you offer us 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, this is the good news. That God does not go back on the promises God made so long ago. God does not reject us. No, God redeems us. God does not withhold love. No, God pours it into our barren lives. So as forgiven of our sins and filled with hope, living in relationship with God and one another, we are indeed a new people. And for this we say, thanks be to God. My friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. I'd like to share with you some of the opportunities as well as celebrations in our life together. Traditionally, we speak about events or folks, ministries right here in the local church here at Peace Memorial. But remember, we are not a community unto ourselves. As Presbyterians, we belong to a larger community called a Presbytery. That includes all of the Presbyterian churches in the Tampa Bay region. And we had a meeting on Friday, done virtually of course, where I learned some things that were truly exciting that I wanted to share with you. Good news. In this time of COVID where people might be a little anxious about the life of the Christian church, the life of the Presbyterian church. In our region, we have started three new worshiping communities. Those are gatherings of people who come to worship God with one another. Now, they don't often look like our traditional worship space but it is a worshiping community nonetheless. And the most exciting news was the recent one will be established in Tampa, Bay, in Tampa, and it is a church for folks who are differently abled. It is also a church for those who are fully abled, and together they will worship God. I think that's really great news. Of course, here at Peace, we have our ongoing ministries. Pastor Bob has his Wednesday morning Bible study and our daily readings of the New Testament. Next Sunday, we will gather and be fed at the table. So we remind you to bring some food for our food pantry. As we are fed, we feed others around us. So now is the time where we are called where we are privileged to go before the throne of grace to offer our prayers and concerns. So please pray with me. Creative, life-giving, triune God, we have gathered to praise you, to celebrate our common life, and give thanks for your breath of life, which sustains and calls us into bold and generative discipleship. While we gather in common purpose, the truth is we come before you with an array of thoughts and feelings. Some of us rest in a place of peace. Some feel burdened and weary. 
Some are anxious not only about their own health, but the health of those whom they love. We want this virus to go away, to be a thing of the past, to release us from its grip. We want to sing together, to walk together, to simply be together. Thank you for the sure and certain knowledge that you journey with us into a future yet unknown. To respond with trust as our four parents, Abraham and Sarah, did so very long ago. When our, Lord, when our load is heavy and too much to bear, your arms are outstretched to aid us. Yours is the compassion that sees our plight, and yours is the grace that we depend on. We give you thanks, loving God, that even though we are socially distanced from one another, we know the blessing of a church family, of this church family that loves and prays for us. We offer words of gratitude for the blessings of family, whether they be of birth or choice, and for our faith that sustains us. We bring to you the concerns of our community we pray for those who grieve, for those who are struggling with matters of health, for those who live with depression made acuter by the physical distancing we are experiencing. We pray for those whose lives have known hatred and violence. In our times of weakness and our time, our hour of need, your voice is heard. Come. Find rest in me. You are our source of healing and wholeness. Now we lift our hearts and our voices in the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is time now for our younger disciples to come closer to hear of God's good news for you. Of course, it's good news for everyone, but I like to take this opportunity to share how it is that you are included in God's story. So you might remember that last week, last week we talked about a covenant, a love promise that God made with Noah and with the whole world. But that's not the only covenant or promise that was made by God. Today we hear the story of another promise. Promise to Abraham and Sarah. Now we studied Abraham and Sarah in Sunday school, but today we're going to speak about the promise, the covenant that God has made with them. You see, Sarah and Abraham, they look a little older, don't they? God promised them that they would have a child. And they thought, mm, I don't know. I'm not sure how that would happen. We're too old. But God promised. God made a covenant. And so Abraham and Sarah had to learn how to trust. Now, they had to trust for a very, very long time. They had to trust for more than a day, more than five days, more than five months. They had to trust for years and years before God's covenant, God's love promise came true. Now, trust can be hard, right? Trust means that you have complete confidence that someone will do what they said they will do. 
you have confidence that they are a person of integrity. Have you ever heard of a trust walk? A trust walk can be a little scary. A trust walk requires you to close your eyes or to wear a blindfold so you can't see where you're going. And a trust walk means that once your eyes are closed, you make yourself vulnerable. You put your hand out and someone walks with you. And you have to trust that they won't walk you into a door or into a wall, or if they take you outside, that they won't let you trip over a tree branch or slip and fall. Trust walks, they can be fun and they can be scary. In today's story, Abraham and Sarah have to go on a very long trust walk with God. So listen to Pastor Bob's sermon and hear about the ways that Abraham and Sarah learn to trust in God's love promises, in God's covenant. Throughout the Lenten season, we are going to take a look at the covenants or promises that God made with God's people. Genesis begins with the creation, setting the covenant of God's rule over the entire universe. The first covenant is with Adam and Eve. The second covenant is with Noah. And in our scripture reading today, we hear of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah reading from Genesis chapter 17, verses one through 10, and picking up verses 15 through 277. Faithfulness to the covenant and hope for fulfillment of God's promises are, take concrete form. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, but me, my covenant is with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants God after you. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are immigrants and the whole land of Canaan as an enduring possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant you and your descendants and every generation. This is my covenant to you and your descendants that must be kept. Circumcise every male. God said to Abraham, for as your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Your name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and give, her, give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of people 
will come from her. Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a 100-year-old man become a father, or Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, have a child? To God, Abraham said, If only you would accept Ishmael. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac. I will set up my covenant with him and with his descendants after him as an enduring covenant. As for Ishmael, I have heard your request. I will bless him and make him fertile and give him many, many descendants. He will be the ancestor of twelve tribal leaders, and I will make a nation great of him. But I will set up my covenant with Isaac, who will be born from Sarah at this time next year. When God finished speaking to him, God ascended, leaving Abraham alone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think we can all agree that we shouldn't make promises that we can't keep. Not if you genu genuinely care for the people that you make the promises to do. If you do so, and you do it enough, then your words become hollow. People will begin to lose faith in you, begin to lose their trust and confidence in you as they move forward. Your words run the risk of becoming empty. So whether it's in small things or whether it's in very big things, we need to keep our promises the best we can. That goes for you, that goes for me, and that goes for God. This season of Lent, we are looking at the covenants that we find in the scriptures the big promises that God has made to God's people that we find scattered throughout the Bible, principally in the Old Testament, but leading into the New Testament as well. And like the one we examined last week, where God promised Noah and all of creation that God would never again give up on us, God would never again um, destroy this world, the sign of the promise given was a rainbow in the sky. Well, today we're going to take a look at another big promise that God makes. In today's passage, God promises Abraham that he will become the father of many nations. That's what the word Abraham means. And the promise that his wife Sarah will bear him a son. But here's the catch. If you listen to the scripture reading, if you listen to Pastor Don's children's sermon, you know that Abraham is now 99 years old and Sarah is not too far behind. And that's no small obstacle when we're talking about having children. These two are on social security, so the prospect of parenthood at this stage of their lives is, well, it's laughable. And in fact, that's exactly what Abraham does. Abraham falls on his face and he laughs which is never a good sign when you make a promise to somebody and that's their response. But there's another reason for Abraham's reaction. You see, this isn't the first time God has made this promise to him. So we're going to take a quick spin through the, the Abraham and Sarah stories uh, from beginning to, to this point as well. And, and let's Let's look at some of the high points of, of the cycle of stories. If we go all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 12, we will meet a 75-year-old man who's now trying to figure out how he intends to spend his retirement years, and his 65-year-old bride who has never been able to conceive a child. And they hear a word from God, Abram. Back then, his name was Abram, not Abraham. Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you, and there I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and through you, all the peoples on earth will be blessed. Wow, and that's a big promise. And believing that promise, Abraham and Sarah packed their bags and they set out for who knows where 
God knows where and who knows what. But the point is trusting God, trusting in that promise made to them by God, they go. But here's the problem. I mean, aside from the fact that Sarah was barren and both of them are are now drawing Social Security and on Medicaid, they did what God asked. They did what God asked. But as the years go by, that promise doesn't come true. They have no land to call their own, and they have no child to carry on their name. So fast forward 10 years or so, and God appears to Abraham again, Abram again, saying, Abram, do not be afraid. Your reward will be very great. And Abram says, yes, I know. But look, I have no heir. And so everything that I end up accumulating in this life is going to be left to my servant. And God says, no, no, not to your servant, but to your son. And one day, Abram, one day your descendants will be as great and as numerous as the stars in the sky. We hear about this in Genesis chapter 15. The promise is repeated. But again, the years roll by. And that promise doesn't seem to be any closer to fruition. So Abram and Sarai decide that maybe God needs a little help in keeping this promise. I mean, don't we always say that God helps those who help themselves? So Abram conceives a child through his wife's maid, a woman named Hagar, and she bears him a son named Ishmael. So Abram now has the son that he always wanted, but the sorrow of his wife is magnified. And of course, this leads to more complications and problems on the home front, as you could well imagine. Sometimes when we get what we thought we wanted, it doesn't work out the way we thought it would. So fast forward now another 10 years or so. And we finally get to our text for today. By now, 25 years have come and gone since that original promise of blessing. And God now makes the promise to them again. He says, no longer will you be called Abram, exalted father. Now you will be called Abraham, father of the nations. No longer will your wife be called Sarai, which means princess, but now she will become Sarah, mother of the nations. And so you can well imagine that after 25 years of this promise being made, and this promise not coming to pass, Abraham is a bit skeptical, and I think that's why he laughs. And who could blame him? Abraham at this point must feel a little bit like Charlie Brown trying to kick the the football that Lucy keeps offering, saying, I won't pull it away again this time. So instead, Abram says, or at this point now, Abraham, Abraham says, oh God, if only Ishmael could live under your blessing. In other words, God, I don't know that this is a promise you can keep at this point, But look, we found a workaround to it. We're good. If only your promise could run through Ishmael. But God says, I know that you have a son named Ishmael. And listen to me, I'm going to bless him too. He is going to become the father of many nations, but I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about Sarah. And I'm telling you that Sarah is going to bear a son And the covenant that I have established with you, lo, those many years ago, will continue on through through the child Sarah will bear. And when that child is born, a year from now, you will name him Isaac, which means laughter. And in return, God asks for a few things. Now, the first and the um, most obvious one in the story is is the right or the mark of circumcision. circumcision. And I'm tempted to say that God now asks Abraham that 
to put a little skin in the game. But having said that, I think maybe there's a better reason. Remember last week when I was talking about covenants, I mentioned that the covenant was a, usually was a promise that was accompanied by a sign. And so the promise made to Noah was the sign of the rainbow in the sky, a sign for all of creation. But here in this story, the sign, the promise is one of progeny, of descendants, lots and lots of descendants. Nations will come from you, God says to, to Abraham. Kings will come from you. The promise is of, of progeny. And so the sign given here to this centenarian is one that is marked on the body. A sign that says, you belong to me, body and soul. But the other thing God asks in this passage, and it's easy to overlook, but it might actually be even more important, is God says to Abraham, walk with me and be trustworthy. Walk with me, God says. Accompany me. Stay in relationship with me. Even when you wonder where this is going, even if you don't know if I am with you, walk with me. Trust me. And be trustworthy. God doesn't ask Abraham to be perfect. Lord knows he isn't. Instead, God asks Abe and God asks us to instead to be trustworthy, to be people of our word to one another and to God, but also to be trustworthy in the sense that we trust that God will keep God's word, that God will keep God's promises, even when it seems God hasn't, to trust that God is still at work, still working his purposes out in the world and in your life. And Abraham believed. Abraham continued to be trustworthy. Abraham trusted and he continued to walk with God. And a year later, Sarah does give birth to a baby boy, one whom they name Isaac, which means laughter. And centuries later, from the lineage of Abraham will come a king, a king of kings, a savior to deliver the nation from its sin and suffering, but a savior, a redeemer who ended up being crucified, put to death on a cross. And it seemed that those promises God made, again, were a promise God would not be able to keep. And yet, if God could bring life and new life and new birth to a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman, then do you think that God could not raise Christ from the dead and crown him Lord of all? If God could keep those promises to Abraham, we see that God still keeps those promises to all the world through Jesus Christ. So may we, may we continue to walk with God and to be trustworthy, to walk with the one who is trustworthy and true to us. And then together, may we all fall on our faces laughing at the foolishness of God, which is wiser than the wisdom of men. Pray let it be. Amen. Promises. Promises is what we have been talking about today. Uh, promises that last a lifetime. I wanted to talk to you about the promises that we make as a church. At every baptism, at every new member ceremony, we, we as a congregation make promises to that child or to that person joining our community of faith that we will walk with them and that we will teach them and train them and be there for them. And I wanted to say that is a promise that we here at the church still intend to take quite seriously, whether it is from children in our nursery to Pastor Dawn and her friends who meet with our, our children during enrichment time, 
Luke, who works with our college students and our high school students and our middle school students, to adult education, to pastoral care to any member of our congregation or those in the community. This is a promise we keep and we keep in so many ways. And congregation, your giving enables us to do all those things. So I wanted to thank you in advance for the ways that you help us as a community of faith to keep our promises to one another. Let's bring our gifts to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the covenant you established with Abraham and Sarah and have opened to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept these offerings with the dedication of our lives that way may be for the world a sign of your abiding love and a testament to your enduring promises. Amen.
Once again, I am so glad that you have taken the time to, to uh, worship with us today. I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to gather in this way and still be the people of peace in a community of Christ. So thank you for being here. I also want to thank all of those who helped make this service possible, from Luke who films it and then edits it and makes us look good and puts it up on, on, and puts it on live on YouTube. I want to thank Pastor Don and, and for Don Gallagher, our liturgist this morning, for Tim and the choir, for the beautiful flowers today that came from Beth Daniels. And as we prepare to draw this time of worship to a close, I pray that you will go forth and to live in that promise that God has made to you, trusting that God is walking with you even as you continue to walk with God. And know that we walk together. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and may the fellowship and constant companionship of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you and use you. Amen.